Your college student is home for winter break. It's your chance to really connect with her face to face. College students face academic, social, and emotional challenges that may seem daunting. And those include exposure to alcohol and drugs. There's no secret that the ease of access to alcohol and drugs increases in college. And really we know that partying is part of the passage. So when your college student comes home, you can expect to see some subtle or not so subtle changes in how they're, they look, how they act. It's easy to dismiss and misread these signs as normal for a college life, something that's just a stage he's going through. But how do you know if these changes are something to be concerned about? Hello, I'm Andrea Obstin, and we're here to discuss these issues and learn about the signs of drug and alcohol addiction in college students with Julian N. Hart, Jr. Julian is the clinical director and co-founder of The Next Right Thing in West Hartford. This is a clinical practice that specializes in community-based substance abuse and mental health treatments for adolescents age 16 to 23. They also treat their families. Julian has more than 40 years of clinical experience working with adolescents and substance abuse and psychiatric problems. He has consulted with a variety of public and private schools and universities, including Simsbury High School, Choate Rosemary Hall, Wyndham High School, and Quinnipiac University. Welcome, Julian. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. When a parent sees a child come home from college, how do they know that these changes are normal? What should they be looking for? What should they be asking themselves? When you mentioned child, your child coming home from college, I th first thing I thought about was my stepdaughter's bringing their their laundry home. Yes, first, laundry. The first thing you notice. Is <laughs> That's the first thing you know. The laundry is there. That's a good sign. You, you they haven't done their laundry in six months. And absolutely not. But when the laundry is washed and folded, you have a chance to sit down and talk to them, not by phone, not by FaceTime. But what do you see? And I, some of the signs are really subtle. The, the, the constant with kids who have been doing drugs is they're not telling their family. They're not really telling their parents what happened during the semester. There's huge holes in their story. Right. And especially about their grades, their friendships, but you just know that they're not telling you the whole story. There's, the truth is absent. How would you know that, though? I mean, they've been away for several months. Because they're, they're, they're telling you stuff that just can't be true. They're, and, they're, and it's just in consequential matters. Uh, sometimes as silly as where they ate last night. So they're lying about things that have no consequence? That's correct. And they've fallen into a pattern of just not telling others what's going on with them and at the same time not really telling themselves what they're doing. Why is that a sign of an issue with alcohol or drugs? That's often what prompts that. Unless there's been some other sorts of horrific events that have happened that they just don't want to talk about. Okay. But if there's everyday sort of, what did you have for lunch? And they don't tell you what they had for lunch. Uh, so, and you wonder what that's about. And I've asked kids, when did you start lying about things that didn't matter? Lying about things that didn't matter, okay. Right, I said, but I'd have asked the kids in my program. It's, and they, he said, I'm a compulsive liar now. Now. And I, and I said, and when did that start? It started with drug use. You, every college student runs out of money. You mentioned the fact that there, one of the indicators can be a lack of funds. How do we know the difference between he just ran out of money, he had too much pizza? Well, some college kids have trouble with money management. That's undone. But if I put $150 in your student account and it's gone in three or four days, where did the money go? So I look at both. As I've said to parents, Follow the lies and follow the money. What's, they're not telling you something. So you want to pursue that. 
Okay. You also mentioned something about mysteriously missing possessions. Why would that be a sign of the drug issue? I sold my laptop. I, I sold my iPad. I had to have the money to, to buy drugs. My priorities shift. And so I didn't lose that laptop. I sold it for drugs. But they'll tell you they lost it. I lost it. I left it at the student union and someone walked off with it. But there's a pattern of losing things, of running out of money, and telling you stories that are just somewhat fabulous or incredible. And that could be an early sign? That is the first sign. Really? Right. What about changes in sleeping and eating habits? Does, does that come with a, a, a drug problem? You may want to look for some physical signs and symptoms of drug use, but I'm telling you the number of kids that I've seen, uh, I had a, last week a mom called on Wednesday and said, how quick can we get in to see you? Uh, he's been lying to us all semester. He hasn't gone to a class. And he's home for the holiday and this has come out. He, he, two weeks before Christmas break, he told them that he hadn't gone to a class. And so they came in within three hours. And his problem had been smoking increasing amounts of marijuana. And uh, he wasn't going to class. He was moody, extremely irritable, uh, either sleeping too little or, or, and it looks like depression. So he was sleeping too little, he was sleeping too much, extremely irritable, gone through sums of money, and he had lied to his parents all semester about his classes. He was a junior, and he was failing everything. Wow. And this was an, an unusual thing for this, this young man? Uh, had been an AP student in high school, well, wow. local high school. Looked like a sort of an honorable kid who wouldn't, uh, who wouldn't, and that was what surprised him, the extent of his lying. That was the first thing, and I think that's always the first thing that I can catch. You mentioned something to me about sort of a lack of motivation or interest in activities. That sounds like something that is related to what you just talked about. Is that what happens? Well, for two reasons. If I'm smoking marijuana, I lose interest uh, in, my, in just about everything except smoking. My life becomes, my attention is switched uh, to not my academics, my friends, but how I'm going to get more drugs. Right. So uh, marijuana impairs concentration, memory, motivation, and it's been our experience um, at that point. Kids will go to the student um, health services or sometimes to the family pediatrician and complain of problems with concentration, and they're prescribed stimulant medication. So some of the symptoms of drug use end up looking like depression and they get the meds for that? They look that? like depression, they look like attention deficit disorder, and they're put on medication without the prescribers doing drug tests to see if there's something else that's interfering with the motivation, concentration, mood. So I'm, of the six years we've been in operation, we've taken more kids off of meds than we've put on. Are there other symptoms um, that would indicate um, a problem? Physical symptoms? Physical symptoms. Um, yeah, well, now, switching from marijuana, which has been one of the number one reasons kids have been coming in to uh, treatment. The myth is that marijuana is safe. This marijuana is so powerful. So we are seeing kids with anxiety, depression, uh, even subtle forms of psychosis. From the marijuana? Just from marijuana. Wow. And when they would, I would drug test everybody that walks in the door, and when they were clean, there was nothing else there. So they were, while they were at college, they were put on antidepressants, and, but not drug tested. Wow. So they come home, we drug test them, and often, more often than not, stop medication. So, so now you're talking about marijuana is causing a lot of problems. Uh, if there are physical symptoms associated with opiate use, be it pill or heroin, now those look a lot like flu-like symptoms. So if a child is clam their skin's clammy, they're sweaty, they're complaining of muscle aches and pains. That does sound like the flu. It looks just like the flu, but they haven't got a temperature. That's the indicator they don't have if a temperature. 
if a temperature hits the flu, without a temperature, that may be the signs of opiate withdrawal. Withdrawal? Very quickly. If you stop using, uh, you develop a tolerance for opiates, pills, or heroin very quickly. So if you stop using within, well, 36 hours, you're going to have withdrawal symptoms. So my child comes home from college, doesn't have the access or doesn't want to be using when he or she is here, and this could be an outcome? One of the things that could tell me there's issues going on, it's, it's literally withdrawal? It's withdrawal, and that's when you have to, really, are you really sick? And the chances are pretty good she'll say yes. Um, but I, at this point, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust it. You wouldn't trust the child's own analysis of what's going no, on? No, it looks like the flu. And it has the same sort of rapid onset. Okay. But I thought at that point I would go to CVS. I would get Narcan, which will stop the absorption. She's going to go out and use. If she's drug sick or dope sick, as we say, she's going to use in order to, at least for temporary relief from the withdrawal symptoms. Narcan, that sounds like a bit of an overreaction. First of all, tell us a little bit about what Narcan is. Narcan at one time, not long ago, was used only in emergency room settings. Right, that's what Someone I Someone would come in with respiratory failure, lips turning blue, difficulty breathing, uh, death by opiate overdose is really drowning in your own body fluids. Wow. So, uh, and Narcan, it immediately stops the body's absorption of opiates. And you're in raging withdrawal when you come out of the uh, use of Narcan. But because the opiate epidemic has reached the proportions that it has, there are pharmacies that will dispense it without a doctor's prescription. So I can go to my local pharmacy? That's absolutely correct. And get Narcan? Uh, yes. If you found pills, if you found these little funny envelopes that look like they're a little bigger than stamps, your child's in trouble. And they may not admit it uh, right away. I, you know, I hesitate because I've seen this happen. I've seen kids, most of the overdoses happen at home. Mm -hmm. They don't happen on the street. So and I, I, I've seen a couple of mothers that had to go through uh, chest compressions to keep their kid going. Um, so you're saying you find these things, I should just proactively go out and have this in the house? Well, it, I don't want to be an alarmist. It, w it wouldn't hurt. Um, and I would have, I, I, would, I would say, not being overly critical, you don't know what your child's doing. Okay. But you do a drug test for me. I'm not accusing you for my sake, because I, I just don't know what's happening with you. That's what you, you might, how you might say, start the conversation? Right. For my sake as a parent, because there's been so many kids in trouble in our town with opiates, would you do me a favor and take a drug test? You're probably clean, or you may not have much in your system, but for my sake. So what's the child going to say to that? If there's no way, then that level of, of denial, uh, defensiveness, your child's got a problem. So a lot of the symptoms you've mentioned, flu-like symptoms, change in sleeping habits, um, lying, running out of money, these, are, these kind of seem like normal things for a college student. How do I, as a parent, know it's time to worry about these? It's the extent of it. Okay, it's, it's more than one, yes, to, to more than one of these issues. Yes. But I, again, people, when I say the number one thing to work, to worry about, or to be wary of, is your child repetitively lying about things? that seem to have no reason to do so. Okay. They're lying to you, they're lying to themselves. Well, which came first? I'm not doing that much. And at college, there's college norming, which is funny because some schools have normed how much you're drinking, how much you're doing. What do you drugs. mean no college norming? Well, they, norming, the uh, Central Connecticut State did it very effectively. They, there was a questionnaire, that, uh, you know, blind questionnaires how much are you drinking, how much are you smoking. Right. And people think that their cohorts are doing more, or that's what they hope to find out, that they're doing, they're actually, so I 
Well, they're not drinking as much as the survey says. They're really not so I'm okay if I'm drinking less than well, everybody I, else. Not, yeah, and it's a, yeah I, 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 everybody's just drinking three or four. And the same with marijuana use. But sometimes social norming has been disastrous, where people are actually using more than the school thought. Wow. So it is, especially freshman year, and alcohol binge drinking, kids do not sip a beer, they guzzle a beer. Uh, women, 80% uh, of the women get transported to hospitals, freshman women. 80% of freshman women for no, alcohol? I, I know. 80% of the transports to the hospital for alcohol overdose were women. Who were, okay. Yeah, who binge drink, who, who drank before. They, no one started, uh, very few kids start using alcohol or drugs in college. It just accelerates. Okay. They started at home. They're 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 away. They're around kids. So, okay, I'm a parent. You've got me concerned. I've answered yes to a couple of these questions. I have no idea how to start that conversation with my daughter. How do I start? I don't want to confront her. I don't want to. You know, the relationship is is always tenuous. How do I start that conversation? You don't say, I think you're a drug addict. That <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> no, it's, these are the behaviors that I'm seeing that concern me. Okay, you're literally just observing. You're noting the behaviors. Okay. And I just don't know why you told me you had macaroni and cheese for lunch today. This sounds really silly. I know you had a BLT. <laughs> What's this? Why are you making up, you know, why are you doing this? Uh, and hopefully say, yeah, I'm not telling the truth about anything. Is that really possible? I mean, I would think a kid would just say, Mom, I think you're being overreactive. I just don't remember what I had for lunch. No, you're staying away from confronting them directly about their drug use. Okay. But to say, I know what you had for lunch. Why did you say you didn't have this? So it's, and they don't, they've deceived themselves, they've deceived you, and uh, so I've seen those confrontations go well. Now parents sometimes need support, and we, we have a parent support group. Uh, in February, I think it's the 7th Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken, we're opening it up to the community because parents have to work with other parents with this. They uh, to get support and to get the you know courage. To so ask the right questions. you're going to have um, regular Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights, open and program. it's open to the public at the next right thing. Yes, has to be. Okay. The parents. Most of the calls I get are from mom. Hmm. The call I got Wednesday was my son has been lying to us. He didn't go to school this semester. So they paid for a semester with the classes and he hadn't gone. So you talked a little bit about this parent group. Is that how I get my child into treatment or is it literally parents talking to parents? Why is that useful? Well, maybe some kids have to go to treatment and there's different, people have equated, if you have a drug problem, then you have to go to way. Right, that's you what have I've to go always to rehab. thought. Right. That's not the case. Uh, you can go away to rehab for 30 days and come back and pick up where you left off. So I'd rather do it. And our whole program is aimed at keeping kids in school, working in college, and treat it where it is. And we can do outpatient detox from heroin or opiates smoothly, successfully, and then get kids to a blocker so they can't use. And, and the role of parents in all of this? I mean, you talked about the parent it's, group. It's setting really firm limits. Okay. And this generation of parents has had a hard time with limits. They've misconstrued their job is to make them happy. Happy, this is the ha happy parenting. Get them involved in activities. Get them in the right classes. Taking AP classes. Extracurricular activities. That's good for our children, isn't it? Well, I had one mom said, well, we, we did everything for him. And as soon as she said it, he wasn't accountable for anything. And But there were other parents who had been through this that had done everything for their kids, essentially, but say no. 
uh, and you can't go back to school until you have a clean drug screen. And uh, so it takes parents helping parents. I, that's truly the cornerstone of my program. Really? Yeah. So the, the groups that you're having on Wednesday starting in January, those are open to the public? I'm opening to the public because we have to. Okay. Because parents just don't want to know, especially around the opiate thing. In this, the greater Hartford area, the number of deaths that have happened, parents don't want to know. And you will see some signs and symptoms. They're hard to know. And, and does that parent group sort of help parents share yes. with each other, this is what I saw and this is what yeah, I did, that kind of thing? Of, a lot of it again. I said, well, we couldn't figure out what, what happened to my son's laptop. He lies. It's the capacity to lie without feeling guilt anymore. Wow. Which is not good moral foundation for adolescent personality development <laughs> because I don't care about you anymore. I'm willing to look you in the eye and lie. And if I lie to you consistently enough, there's no trust and relationships collapse. So give us a couple of final thoughts about, um, as a parent, I certainly wouldn't want to think of my child as a heroin addict. Give us a couple of thoughts to sort of wrap this up about Get me into the reality of the situation. Well, I mentioned to you before, you know, follow the money, follow the lies. All right. And uh, we, we have to work hard to overcome the myth that marijuana is okay. Uh, it's sending more kids to treatment to the hospital than any other drug. Oh. Remind me, there's a stomach ailment that comes along with too much marijuana smoking. A stomach ailment? Yeah, it's called gastroparesis. Okay. And you have severe stomach cramps from smoking too much marijuana. Huh. And kids have gone to the hospital and thought it was stress-related. It was marijuana-related. Wow. Um, so, as I've told you, this isn't the pot your dad's, your dad smoked in 19 in 1970. And I have suggested parents drug test their kids to go to CVS, get a drug test kit, and say, prove it to me. Well, but again, your parent has to be willing to do the tough stuff of parenting and confront their children about what's going you've on. Given us a difficult assignment, but it sounds like we're talking about saving our children's lives. Right so now, yes. thank you very much, Julian. Yes. And a reminder to everyone that those parent groups start in January. They're Wednesdays. If you'd like to know more information about the parent group, you can go to www.nextrightthing.net or give them a call. They're in West Hartford. And thank you very much for watching. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.